once again I will introduce myself. My name is Ami Braun, um, tour guide, live in Jerusalem, and it's great to be with you today on our virtual tour of the Kotel Tunnels. And if we're going to the Western Wall Tunnels or the Kotel Tunnels, what better place to start if not taking a look at the Kotel itself via 360. Here we go. We're taking a look. We've landed at the Kotel Plaza. We can see the Western Wall. We can see the Kotel. Let's twist a little bit from within the plaza. We'll get a view of the Jewish Quarter. And now we'll finish our 360 by taking a look at these arches that are on the side over here. And that's where the Kotel, our tour of the Kotel Tunnels is going, to begin, or is going to begin in a few moments. But you know what? Let's go back and take a look at a picture of the classic area of the wall um, and talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing today. Look, we're going to be going through about three different topics and three themes as we're making our way through the Kotel Tunnels today. The first is we're going to be going through the classic part of the tunnels, and that's where we're going to be most of the time. In addition to that, we're going to get a bit of a sneak peek, just a little bit of the, some of the behind the scenes, um, some of the newer areas of the Kotel Tunnels that have been recently excavated, just a bit of a taste of that. And we're in Slichot now, okay? We're in Chodesh Elul, we're in the Hebrew month of Elul, right before the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So of course we're going to be connecting to that all together over here as we, wake, we, as we make our way through the Kotel Tunnels, through the Western Wall Tunnels. But what, are the, what is the Kotel? Where does it come from? And what is its story? In order to answer that question, let's flip back to our PowerPoint presentation. And as we're doing that, let us start making our way in. A little bit of a background. We're looking right now at a picture that shows us what Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, Tarabait, and the Second Temple, the Second Beit Mikdash, looked like 2,000 years ago at the end of Second Temple era. But if we build it up just very briefly, if we move all of this away, underneath uh, the area of the Temple Mount, we'd see a hill called Hara Moriah, Mount Moriah, uh, where according to tradition, that's the place of creation that is the center of the world. It's over there that the first temple is later going to be built by King Solomon, HaMelech Shlomo, 3,000 years ago, later destroyed by the Babylonians, rebuilt. And then the second temple, the second Beit Mikdash, is going to stand for roughly 600 years. And we're going to jump forward now to the end of second temple era, as I mentioned before. And let me, what I want to do is, is I'm going to change... Um, the pointer to be laser, and here we go. And now let's take a look at what we have in front of us. We're taking a look at this big square over here, which is called Harabait. It is called the Temple Mount, all right? Now, in the middle of the Temple Mount, we have the second temple that's built on top of it. It is when the Romans are ruling here, all right? During the first century before the Common Era, a little bit over 2,000 years ago, that they will, will take a man named Herod and make him king. Yeah, it's a bit more complicated than that, but we'll leave it at that for now. And he's going to be the one who's going to build up this massive structure over here. Now, the second temple, as it's sitting on top of this massive plateau, um, is being held up by four massive retaining walls. We have the western retaining wall right over here, which is over 1,500 feet long. We have the southern retaining wall, Parallel to the western wall, we'll of course, have the eastern retaining wall. And on this side over here, we're going to have the northern retaining wall. But of course, today, we're going to focus on the western retaining wall, okay? And if this whole massive wall is over 1,500 feet long, you might be saying to me, Ami, I've been to the wall before. The wall is not that long. And I'll say, you're right, it's not. It's this little section over here, okay? This little section that I'm pointing to right now with the laser is only an eighth in length of the entire length of the Western Wall, meaning it's about 200 feet long. That is all. And that's what we see today. But where does the rest of the wall disappear to? So to answer that question, what we're going to do is we're going to first of all go to the year 70 of the Common Era. And it's in that year that the Second Temple was destroyed. All right. And later on what's going to happen is, is the Muslims are going to conquer Jerusalem about 1,300 years ago. And they're going to build the Golden Dome of the Rock in the spot where the two temples used to stand in the past. That is right over here I'm pointing to right now. And it'll be later in the Middle Ages, about seven, 800 years ago, that the Mamluks, devout Muslims, will come, conquer Jerusalem, and they will build these homes over here. And these homes over here, in essence, will cover up the Western Wall. And in the end, we're going to be left with this little section 
that we have today. And to get a better um, aerial shot, if you want to call it that, let's take a look at what we have today. And let's take a look at where we are going to be walking to today. So again, now, if before we were looking, taking a view from the western side, now we're looking at everything from the southern side. This is the southern side, okay? We're looking northward to the top of the screen over here. But we want to focus today, again, on the western side of Harabait, the Temple Mount, the western retaining wall. Um, here is what I put in this um, like ovalish um, uh, shape over here in red. This is uh, the Kotel, the western wall from on top with the plaza that we know that we were standing in in Google 360 or Google Street View a moment ago. That's over here. Now in a moment what we're going to do is, is we're going to head inside over here and we're, it's going to be really cool because today we're going to be using technology of Google Street View, which means we will literally be walking through the Kotel tunnels via Google Street View. I'm using all these still uh, pictures in advance just to give a bit of a, an introduction to where we're going to be going today. Um, so what we're going to do in a few moments is we're going to head inside. We're going to start making our way through the tunnels. We're going to zig and zag a little bit. Eventually, we're going to get to this area of the Kotel, the area that's a continuation of the exposed area that's outside, inside. We're going to speak over here a little bit. And then, as the red arrows are pointing to, we are going to walk along the rest of the Kotel underneath the Muslim Quarter, not underneath the Temple Mount. People get confused many times. It's not underneath the Temple Mount. If this is the Temple Mount over here, Harabait over here, we are going to be walking outside on the western side of the western retaining wall, underneath the Muslim Quarter all along, until at the end we're going to sort of uh, move away a little bit from the Kotel Tunnels and when we get to our last stop. But one more thing before we go inside, before we go back to Google Street View and continue along. And that is this picture over here. We're now in Elul. And, and in the special month of Elul, this is the time of preparation. The Hebrew month of Elul, which usually comes out around September, this is the time of preparation for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, for the High Holy Days. Um, let's make a connection regarding these days and go back for a minute to all the way to Sefer Shmot, to the book of Exodus, and to Bnei Israel and to the Israelites walking in the desert and coming up to Mount Sinai, coming up to Har Sinai. The picture that we see right now on the screen is a picture of a stone from a mountain called Mount Kalkom. It is in the western Negev Desert. This might have been the original Hal Sinai, the original Mount Sinai. We, we don't know. It's, in theory, one of them. But on this mountain, there's some really, really beautiful etchings and, and drawings on stones. And on this stone over here, we can see this interesting drawing with 10 cubes to it. Is this a picture of a Sereta di Brot? Is this a picture of the Ten Commandments? Maybe. And if we go back to the book of Exodus, with Bnei Israel, with the Israelites standing in front of Mount Sinai, Hal Sinai, and the, the Pasuk will describe, so the people remained at a distance while Moses approached, uh, approached the thick cloud where God was. And then Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, to Hal Sinai, for 40 days where he receives the Ten Commandments. He receives the Luchot Habrit, the tablets. The problem is, is when he comes down 40 days later, he's going to go up right after Shavuot on the seventh day of the Hebrew month of Sivan, and he's going to come down 40 days later. And the day will be the 17th day of the month of Tammuz. Yud Zayin Tammuz, when he comes down, he sees the ancient Hebrews, Bnei Israel, doing the sin of Chet Egel, of the golden calf, and he will take these tablets and he will throw them on the ground. He will then wait down below for a while, and but then, by the time Rosh Chodesh Elul, the beginning of the month of Elul comes around, Moshe will go back up to Mount Sinai once again for another 40 days, and he will receive, or he will create, the second set of the Luchot, of the tablets. And as it says in the book of Exodus, the Lord says to Moses, carve two tablets of stone like the first, and I will inscribe upon the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you shattered. By, uh, be ready by morning, and in the morning come up to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. This Moshe does, and he spends 40 days on top of Mount Sinai. If we go to Rosh Chodesh Elul, to the very beginning of the month of Elul, and we count 40 days forward, what day are we going to come to? We're going to arrive at Yom Kippur, at the Day of Atonement. It's on that day that Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moses is going to come down from the mountain with the second version of the Luchot of the Tablets. 
These are called Luchot takana, Luchot kapara, the tablets of redemption. And they're going to make their way, along with the broken ones, into Kodesh Kodeshim, into the Holy of Holies, the room that is going to be inside the temple that we're going to talk about later, that the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, would enter on Yom Kippur. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself because we will talk about that later. But I want you to keep this in your mind as we make our way through the Kotel Tunnels. And what we're going to do now is we're going to flip screen. We're going to go back onto Google Street View. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go for a bit of a ride over here. And we are going to land in the Kotel Tunnels. We're going to land in the Western Wall Tunnels. Sometimes it gets a little stuck. Here we go. It's amazing because basically all we're walking is a few dozen feet from the Kotel Plaza to the actual Kotel Tunnels. But here we took a ride of half of Israel. But that's always a lot of fun. Ladies and gentlemen, where did we just come from? We came from the Kotel Plaza. There we go. Okay, and now it's time to go into the Kotel Tunnels. And I'm going to flip my cheat sheet, which you're not supposed to see, just so that I remember what to say. And we're going to make our way into the tunnels. Now, here we go. Um, we're making our way um, inside. Now, what we can see, which can help us just a little bit, um, at the entrance of the tunnels, there's this topographical model over here. And what I want to do is I want to do a bit of a close-up to it. There we go. Remember at the beginning I was speaking about topography, and if we were here several thousand years ago, if we move everything away, we'd see a hill. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. We're looking at it right here. This is Hara Moriah, and this is Mount Moriah, and it's on top of this area over here is where the temple, um, the temple mount and the temple uh, stood. The Temple Mount still stands, and the temple stood in the past. But now we're going to make our way in. And as we make our way into the Kotel Tunnels, you may be asking, so Ami, what exactly are these tunnels? Who lived inside of these tunnels? And the answer is nobody lived inside of these tunnels. Nobody really walked inside. These tunnels were created, I'm repeating a bit of what I said before, they were created by the Mamluks, the devout Muslims who came to Jerusalem in the Middle Ages, seven, eight hundred years ago. And they built these tunnels not for anybody to walk through here, but rather as a base to the homes that are above our heads. Okay, above our heads they built their homes. And what we're doing right now is we're walking inside of these seven, eight hundred year old tunnels that were filled up with earth and dirt. And what happens is it's only after the sixth or 1967, the following year in 68, the, the Israeli government starts clearing everything out so that we can walk inside. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to present you now to the Kotel. We have arrived at the original 2,000 year old stones of the Kotel, of the Western Wall. Let's take a look. Let's get a bit of a feel. You may want to raise your hand and sort of put it in front of you and feel the stones and imagine what they feel like, but we'll talk about that a little bit more. If we would walk through this door over here and we'd continue a little bit south, just a few dozen feet, we'd be standing outside by the exposed area of the Kotel where we were before. And if it gets a little confusing, which it does when we're inside the tunnels, not to mention when we're doing this virtually, let's go back a moment to our map and take a look um, at where we're at. Here we go. We, walk, we entered from over here. We walked along these red lines over here, and we arrived at over here. This is where we're at right now. Okay? And soon enough, we're going to continue walking along this path over here. But now that we understood where we're at, let's go back to Google Street View. And here we go. And let's set our camera over here. I think this is the best angle. And I don't know about you, but we've been walking for quite a bit. And we came from outside where it's a little hot. So I'm going to take a drink. And excuse me for a second. I have to tell you that I was outside today guiding in the heat of the summer over here. And it is an absolute pleasure to be doing this virtually. And there's also plenty of Advantages for you to be sitting at home in your comfortable living room and not out in the heat in the middle of the day. Tov, the Kotel tunnels a little bit. <clears throat> so if we understand now that we're standing over here by the 2,000-year-old stones of the Kotel, not only are we by these original stones, the original wall, this stone over here is unique. And when I say this stone, what do I mean? To understand the stone that I want to talk about, let's start with the row that's underneath, the bottom row. And that's this row that is over here. I want you to take a look. Each frame is a stone, meaning we have one stone, two stone, three, four, five, 
it continues along. We have another stone over here, six, seven, you get the idea. And now I want to take a look at this massive stone that's right over here. This is the northern side of this stone. We can see this line, this frame. And now we're going to run along it some more and some more and some more until we get to over here. This is the southern end of the stone. This is all, just one stone. That is all. This stone, and I'm going to say it in feet, okay? If you want to know it in meters, just divide my numbers by about three. This stone is about 40 feet long. It was originally about 10 feet high, and it's over a meter, meaning over a good three, four feet deep. And when I'm standing in front of a group, I usually ask, I want people to throw out numbers. How much do you think this stone weighs? Um, and you can write it in the chat if you want. I can't quite read the chat right now, but you can just guess for yourself. How much do you think this stone weighs? And I will answer, I will say the following. This stone weighs about 600 tons. I have no idea what 600 tons really is. I'm not a building contractor. So let's see this, say this differently. This stone weighs the weight of about 200 elephants which is incredible, it's tremendous. Um, and if that's the case, the question that many people start asking is, how do they move this stone? I mean, that is absolutely incredible to move something like that. So, you know what, I'll explain a little bit how they, um, uh, how they move this stone, and then we're gonna watch a short movie that will help us to understand how they used to move uh, this stone. There are quarries that are north of the area of the old city in Jerusalem. Now, we don't know specifically what quarry the stone came from, but whatever quarry it came from, the people would come to the quarry, okay, um, and they started digging into the bedrock underneath what the stone would eventually be. Once they've dug through the bottom of the stone, but the rest of the stone is still connected to the bedrock, it's still connected to the mountain, they would put wooden logs underneath the stone, sort of like uh, railway tracks, and only at that point would they disconnect the rest of the stone from the mountain that surrounded it. You bring oxen, okay? You bring, obviously, ropes, and then they would drag the stone and put it into place. This morning, in the news, um, there was a report that, they, that the archaeologists just found another quarry in Jerusalem. They found already several around the city. They just found a new one. And there have Chotzvim, um, Jerusalem's high-tech center, where they quarried stones. I'm not saying that this stone is from there. But again, you have so many stones over here, not just the big one, but you have your average stones, which weigh two, three, four tons. Most of the stones of the Kota weigh up to, at most, a couple dozen tons, but this one over here is unique. But there's nothing like watching a movie um, to show how they used to move the stones. So I'm gonna flip back to my PowerPoint presentation over here, and let's see um, how they used to move, move the stones. Let me just go back to my, just a second, my regular pointer. There we go. And here we go. These stones were brought in carts, hitched to oxen. Some of the stones were encircled with wooden wheels so that they could be moved quickly and efficiently. Particularly, large stones were placed on long log rollers and moved by a large team of workers with the help of animals. To lift the stones up high, the workers used cranes, pulleys, and sloped earthen embankments. The stones were put in place with the utmost precision. Now, I want to thank the Megalim Institute, Mahon Megalim, that belonged to Ir David, to the city of David, uh, for this movie. And I use and create clips out of their different movies. Um, going to YouTube, right, Machon Megalim, or the Megalim Institute, and they have the most amazing short movies, animated movies, seven to 15 minutes long, about Second Temple Aaron. We're gonna see another one of them as we continue through this virtual tour over here. But let's go back now um, to Google Street View here. Let's just prepare this, it'll be a little bit later. And we've landed over here back by the large stone. And a very interesting feature over here by the stone of the holes that are in this area of the wall, what is the story of the holes? And no, it's not for notes. It's also apparently not for dragging the stone in this particular case, but rather the following. <laughs> Look, after the Romans destroyed the second temple, they built a water cistern around this whole area, <laughs> excuse me, um, where these steps are today. Now, since 
the Temple Mount and most places, honestly, in, in Israel are built out of limestone. Limestone is porous, so the water, it, it's like a sponge. The water sort of goes into these stones and the Romans are going to lose their water. We say in Israel, it's very important to save every drop, also today in the year 2021 and also to 2,000 years ago. So what the Romans do is they're going to build this wall over here. Okay, In this wall, they put plaster along it. We can see the plaster over here. And the plaster over here holds the water out. Look, this wall simply covered this whole area of the Western Wall where we see these holes. Now think Lego. In order to make sure okay, that this wall holds up against the Kotel Hama'aravi, against the Western Wall, um, they build, the Romans make these holes, and they put in bricks, which we can see one, two, and even number three over here. And these bricks held up this wall over here against this whole area of the western wall and that way made sure that it didn't fall over. The bricks actually went from one side being inside the western wall to this wall over here that used to cover the western wall and it would it was like it was a brick that held the two walls together. Uh, look before we continue along and we're going to continue along soon. We're come back to here soon enough and we're going to continue walking along the coast of the western wall. I promised you a little bit of the newer archaeological excavations inside the Kotel tunnels. So we're going to go check out one area. In order to check out that area, let's flip back to our PowerPoint. Here we go. And as we're making our way through the Kotel tunnels, it's actually from the entrance. In order to get um, to the area of the big stone into the western wall, at a certain point we're walking through a little area and we look down below and what do we see? We see this hole and underneath it we see a room. Now what's inside this room? Let's go take a look. And here's this room, we've come down. This is an extremely fancy room. We have an entrance, okay, we have an exit over here, we have two massive frames around these very fancy doors. This is a 2,000 year old room. It's apparently a hall where events took place, built during the time of King Herod. And let's start sort of moving around. And what we're going to see in the walls are what's called pilasters. Pilasters are these columns that I'm running my blue mouse over here along that are built into the wall. And it will make our way around. We're going to continue seeing these pilasters. But not only are there, are there pilasters, there is also an edge or a cornice that's this ledge over here, and which is making its way around and still more pilasters as we can see over here and over here. You get the idea. I'm pointing this out to show you the grandeur and the glory of this very, very fancy room. And we're going to continue making around. We're going to do a full uh, 360 to get the whole idea over here. And when we finish with that, let's sort of, uh, the camera is going to turn up. And I created this video. And we're going to take a look at the roof and let's see where we came from. All right. It'll continue along. And here we go. We were actually looking from up above from over here before. So that's this room over here. And let's just finish the video. And once we finish taking a look at this fancy room over here, this room is, they discovered already in the early 1970s. It's not a new regular route of the Kotel Tunnel Tour, but this room was not recently discovered. What was recently discovered? What was recently discovered is what's next to this room. and was discovered by Dr. Shlomit Wexler Bdolach, archaeologist, and it, she and I'm going uh, I'm I'm to press play for a minute of the next video to, give, to explain what I'm talking about, but she's going to discover the continuation of this room going on an east-west axis, all of this dating back to the Roman era and a second temple 2,000 years ago. So now we're going to leave this room, okay, that we were walking through before, and we're going to go through a hall that connected this beautiful hall to another hall, but along the way, look what we have. Along the way, we have this wall with these columns. What the lights have lit up right now, and I froze the video on purpose for a second, is the, the, the lit up areas are, again, pilasters with Corinthian column tops on top. And on the very top, we can't really see in the video, there's holes. There's a hole here, a hole here. There's a hole in every Corinthian column top. Why a hole? Because water would come out of over here. Beyond these columns over here, beyond this wall over here, was a big room which held water and the water came out of the holes that came from the Corinthian column tops and they'd come into pool. This is crazy. This is such a tremendously beautiful, fancy archaeological find that it's, it's, it, it's, it, 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 it really um, it blows your mind 
and it made news headlines uh, when it was found. And we're making our way through to the next room. Again, we're going on an east-west axis. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn around with the camera to get a bit of a feel of what we just walked through. So let's take a look. Here we go. And I'm going to stop the video. This is the room that we entered from a moment ago. Okay, and that's where we did our 360. Then we left that room and we walked through this hall over here with uh, uh, pilasters. We can see the bottom of this pilaster over here that again water came out from, from on top. And this led to the next room, okay, that we're going to be entering right now. The distance from one wall all the way to the other wall is going to be 29 meters. That's almost 100 feet. And, and also in this room over here, what we can see is, as the camera sort of focuses itself, is again, we can see in the next room over the pilasters that are lit up and on top were holes which water came out through. And this is another beautiful, beautiful room um, where they had events. There was a mikvah ritual bath that was later built, but that's a little less of our topic today. So this is a little bit of the behind the scenes in the newer archaeological findings um, that we can see today. Um, another archaeological finding that's been excavated over the last few years um, and there have been a few people that excavated it. I personally heard an explanation from Dr. Avi Salomon, but also Dr. Joe Ziel, um, archaeologists are in charge of the dig over there. And this, what we're looking at over here, looks like a small theater. Okay, it's not really a theater. It's either an odeon, a small area that looks like a little theater where we had music, or it was a place where the city elders would gather. But hold on. What era are we talking about and where exactly are we located? To understand where we're located, what I want you to do is I want you to take a look. And now I feel comfortable going back to my red pointer that I don't have because we don't have movies. Um, is, guys, these are the stones of the cult. I'll take a look at the frame around each stone. The classic um, way to recognize the stones of the Kotel are the Herodian frame around each stone. These are the stones of the Kotel, but they're underneath where we walk. When we go today to the Kotel Plaza, we go into the men's section. You go to the, uh, to the men's section, then you make a left. You have that inside section where it's shaded. Um, if we go into there, underneath where we're standing, okay, go 13 meters. That's 40 feet down below. We reach this. These columns, one, two three, and a bunch more, are third, here, here you go, one, two, three, four more columns. They go up 13 meters above where this picture was taken from because they're holding up the floor of the Kotel. They also go five meters, 15, 16 feet down below where this small Odeon, what we would maybe call a theater, um, is located. Now, when is it dated from? Um, Dr. Avi Solomon is going to date it to post-second temple era. It's after this destruction, meaning if the second temple was destroyed in the year 70 of the Common Era, we'll jump forward 60 years to the time of the Bar Kochva Rebellion, which we'll be talking about also at the end of the tour. The Romans will apparently build it up then. Build it up then. It's very small. There's maybe two, originally there were 250 to 280 seats over here. Um, and that was it. Was it even used? Obviously, Dr. Avi Salomon's theory is, was that it was not used. They didn't finish working on it. It, it. They did not finish the work on it and didn't use it in the end at all for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to get into right now. But ladies and gentlemen, this is also another site, sort of behind the scenes, some of the newer archaeological findings um, that's not part of the classic tour. But yalla, I think it's time to go back to Google Street View. Let's go back to our large stone. Here we've landed. And you'll forgive me again with all the ups and the downs and the steps going around out and about. I need to get a bit of a, a drink. Let me take a shluk, as we call it in Hebrew. And what we're going to do now is we are going to continue walking along the Kotel. What I want to do, what I want to encourage you to do is as follows. As we're going to be walking along the Kotel now, from now on almost to the end of our tour, we are going to have the original 2,000-year-old stone star, right? Lift up your hand at home. Put out your hand to the right. Pretend you're touching these stones. Imagine to yourselves what these stones would feel like. All right, are they rough? Are they slick? Are they a little cold? Are they a little wet? All of the above are the answers. And let's try to get a bit, a bit of a feel of these stones, especially during this time of year, during the time of Slichot. <coughs> Excuse me. As we're making our way through, we just made our way up these steps over here, and we can see this gate over here that's called Warren's Gate. It's inside of Warren's Gate today, which this gate leads to inside, to underneath the Temple Mount. Of course, this gate is shut, but it's a gate, an entrance dating back to Second Temple era. Back then it was open. You'd enter inside and find yourself on the Temple Mount. Um, from the 
7th to 11th centuries, there's actually a synagogue built inside, meaning over a thousand years ago, there was a synagogue built inside over here called the Cave Synagogue, the Knesset Hame'ara, and uh, Rabbi Getz, the Rabbi of the Kotel Tunnels, uh, uh, excuse me, the Rabbi of the Kotel from the late 60s until the mid-90s, um, actually entered inside here. It wasn't always shut to the top. In the early 1980s, he went searching for the Aron HaBrit and Nuchot HaBrit, the Ark of Covenant and the tablets, which were not found and are still a mystery till today where they are located. But we are now going to arrive at the closest spot that we can get along the Kotel to the location of Kodesh HaKodeshim, the Holy of Holies and the Temple. In order to show again where we're located exactly right now, let's go back to our PowerPoint presentation. And what I want to do is, is let's flip back quickly. And here we go, in large screen. We're located, uh, let me just a second, here's the pointer. We're located right over here. Okay, this is it. We're in a direct line, Dome of the Rock today. Underneath it is Evan Hashtiyah, the foundation stone, the place of the, t the first and second temples and the location of the Holy of Holies of Kodesh HaKodeshim. Now, if that's the case, and we are standing over here, meaning if we go inside over here, and we go through these stones straight through 97 meters, a little over 300 feet, we reach the foundation stone. Um, it's around the foundation stone that Kodesh HaKodeshim, the Holy of Holies, was built during the first and second temples. And it's on, on only one day a year that one man is allowed inside. And that is, of course, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the Kohen Gadol, the High Priest, would enter this room. And as we are making our way, I mean, Rosh Hashanah is already tomorrow night, meaning Yom Kippur is only about 12 days away. When the Kohen Gadol, the High Priest, was inside, what would he pray? What would he say? Let's flip back to our PowerPoint, okay? And let's go over to over here. And we are going to take a look at what the Kohen Hagadol would say. If we open up the Talmud Babli, the Babylonian Talmud, it describes, it says, and the high priest, the Kohen Hagadol, recites a brief prayer, prayer in the outer chamber. It's not quite in the Holy of Holies, it's a little bit outside. I'm not going to get into the details right now. And here's the prayer. May it be your will, Lord our God, that this year shall be rainy and hot. He's asking for it to be a good year regarding weather. All right, you need to realize back then most people are agricultural workers. You need it to be rainy in the right time. You need it to be hot in the right time for the crops to grow. If the, coming, if the upcoming year is hot, may it also be rainy, lest the heat harm the crops. May the rule of power not depart from the house of Judah, and may your nation Israel not depend on each other for sustenance. Rather, they should be sustained from the produce of their land. He's basically saying, may everybody be able to make their own parnasah. May you be able to rely on yourself to make a, li a living. May you not need to, God forbid, go need to ask for financial help from others. Parnasa, making a respectable livelihood. And let not the prayer of travelers enter your presence uh, when they pray for the rain to stop on their travels. Basically, asking for weather at the right time so that our crops will grow, which is, of course, a very important, very central part of life back then. Asking that we should have a respectable livelihood, um, uh, be able to make a respectable livelihood. When we open up the Machzor for Yom Kippur and we say, Seder HaVodah, the prayer that was said in all the activities that were done in Beit HaMikdash, and we give the prayer, they, we say the prayer of the Kohen Gadol, the High Priest, that this is just a part of, we can connect to the prayers that the Kohen Gadol, the High Priest, would say two and three thousand years ago to us today. I don't think there's that much of a difference from back then to the year 2021. All right, for all the different prayers and hopes that we have for the upcoming year, for the upcoming Jewish year of 5,782. And when the Kohen Agadol, the high priest, would come out, there's the description um, regarding what he looked like, the radiance that was coming out of his face, um, and more when he came out. And this is some that we'll read on Yom Kippur from the Machzor, and it says like this, How glorious was the appearance of the Kohen Agadol when he safely exited the Holy Sanctuary. As the expanded canopy of heaven was the expression of the Kohen. As the appearance of the rainbow in a cloud was the expression of the Kohen. As the rose in the midst of a delightful garden was the expression of the Kohen. As the amiable tenderness depicted on the face of the Chatan, the bridegroom, was the expression of the Kohen. Saying this as we're standing over here across from Kodesh HaKodeshim is very meaningful. And what we're going to do now 
is we're going to continue along. And if you've been before in the Kotel tunnels, you know that you can actually stand inside over here. I'm sorry, Google Street View simply does not stand straight inside, so we're sort of skipping through. Um, we're dependent on uh, the Google Street View technology. And here we are, we're going to start, we're going to continue walking along the tunnels. It's a narrow area, and we still have, till almost the end of the tour, the original 2,000 year, year old stones to our right. But as we're making our way along, along, we are going to walk above this window. And underneath this window, we have a couple stones. It's hard to see over here, so I'll show you a better picture in a minute. But underneath this window that's underneath us right now, we have two of the original stones of the Kotel that were knocked down 2,000 years ago, <coughs> excuse me, from above to underneath. To understand this a little better, we go back to our PowerPoint. Here we go. We can see piles of stones from the Kotel that aren't in the Kotel tunnels, but they're actually on the southern end of the western retaining wall of the Temple Mount, an area called the Southern Excavations or the Davidson Center. What the Romans did is 2,000 years ago, when they destroy <laughs> the Second Temple, they'll also come up to the Temple Mount itself, to the retaining walls, and they will knock down the, sto the stones from the top rows from above to down below. And what we see over here is unmoved, for the last 2,000 years, are these stones um, of the Kotel of the Western Wall. They are a remembrance to the destruction of the Second Temple. Tisha B'Av, excuse me, is a fast day because of this destruction. When we go to a wedding, the Chatan, uh, the groom underneath the chupa, the canopy, will shatter a glass cup with his foot and he'll say, Im Yerushalayim, tishakach If I forget Jerusalem, may my, <laughs> excuse me, may my right hand wither. We see this for real, this destruction over here with our own two eyes. Um, and again, back to Machon Megalim, uh, the Megalim Institute, and, and they created a movie, a, a longer movie about the destruction, and over here we can see a, a clip of it. Fear. On the 9th of Av, towards evening, Titus gave the order, and the following day, the 10th of Av, his soldiers set fire to the sanctuary. The temple that had been the source of inspiration, faith, ethics, and righteousness for the Jewish people and all humanity for centuries now went up in flames. The cries of pain of the Jews rose up to the heavens. So, fear. Back to our PowerPoint. And that's, excuse me, to Google Street View. We're going to continue along, and we're making our way through this uh, narrow area over here. And um, when we come out of this narrow part of the tunnel, we're already way past half point of the tour, and we are going to arrive in the marketplace area. Let's understand where we're at. Of course, the Kotel over here. Here's the wall of the Kotel. We're still walking along it. We came through this tunnel right now that I'm pointing to right now. We came out of it. The pavement stones on the floor are the original 2,000-year-old pavement stones of the marketplace that was built all along the entire length of the Kotel Amaravi, of the Western Wall 2,000 years ago. And we're going to emphasize this marketplace in a moment. Let me just finish showing you what's here. We see one and two columns that stood over here back then. But this was an open area. This wall that's over here right now didn't exist. The ceiling that's above our heads, um, I can't angle it completely to the top because then Google Street View goes a little crazy, but above us is a ceiling um, that also um, did not exist. This is an open marketplace area. And we can see how these pavement stones are worn out, not just from the tours from the 20th and 21st centuries, but they were found worn out. Why? From our ancestors that walked here 2,000 years ago when they were Ole Regel. And we're going to be giving a whole Aliyah La Regel virtual tour in two weeks from now. So this is just going to be a bit of a sneak peek, okay, regarding the Ole Regel, the pilgrims that are making their way to here on Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuot. And when they arrive to here, um, what's going on? In order to try and um, um, experience what's going on, let's use our senses a little bit to try and relive what's going on over here, our sense of touch. Um, we can pretend to touch these pavement stones when I'm standing over here with groups. I tell them, uh, touch it with your, with your shoes, okay, with your feet, don't touch it with your hands, but touch it with your shoes and feel, get the feel of these stones over here, the sense of touch, the sense of sight. We're looking around, and guys, we can see dozens of thousands of Olei Regel, family members, neighbors, strangers who we don't even know, as they're coming up over here. 
we can see or use the sense of smell in order to smell the smell of the ktoret, of the incense that used to come from Beit HaMikdash. And Chachamim and Chazal tell us that the smell was so strong that the goats in Jericho, several miles east of Jerusalem, would sneeze from the smell over here. And the sense of sound, okay? Um, what would happen is, is on top of the Kotel, in the, the south, southwestern corner, a Kohen would come and blow a trumpet. When would he, when would he do this? As Shabbat and Chag, as Shabbat and Sabbath and holidays are coming in. And we found it. Archaeologists found it. I get to talk about it. They found the place where the Kohen stood and blew the trumpet. Um, what we can see is this stone over here that was found in the southwestern corner of the Temple Mount. It's a massive stone that was knocked on by the Romans. It was found by that layer of stones, the pile of stones that uh, we saw before. And what does it say over here? It says, you know, let's go back to our uh, pointer option. Here we go. Lebeit hatki'a lehach, lehachriz. To the trumpeting house to announce. And what does the Talmud tell us? The Talmud gives a whole description of a series of the, the trumpet blowing that the Kohen would blow to tell people, okay, Shabbat is about to come in, time to come in from your fields, time to close shop, and another series of blowing the trumpet until Zehu, Shabbat has come in. In Jerusalem and in other cities in Israel, you have a siren that goes off right before Shabbat based on the Kohen blowing his trumpet 2,000 years ago in order to announce that Shabbat and Chag and holidays are coming in. Uh, it was found in the southwestern corner, in this area over, that's where the, the, the Kohen would go blow his trumpet. But if we're coming to over here to the temple, to Beit HaMikdash, and we're visiting, we can get a beautiful view of it over here from the east in the direction of west. And in two weeks from now, when we come on our virtual tour of Aliyah La Regel, of our pilgrimage to the temple, we'll also walk around a little bit inside and talk about what's inside and what was going on over here. But since today we're emphasizing the western retaining wall, the Kotel HaMa'aravi of the Temple Mount, let's go to there, okay, and let's go to Slichot, okay? And here we are uh, in a picture that honestly I'm looking at and it looks so surreal during COVID. We are like 50,000 people bunched up over here and I've been leading a lot of uh, Slichot tours these days and there's still people at the Kotel and it's nice, but I can only hope the next year and very soon we'll be able to fill it up like this again without any um, uh, health risk. Um, but during the month, the Hebrew month of Elul, and leaning into the beginning of the Hebrew month of Tishrei, and all the way to Yom Kippur, the Sfaradim start saying slichot, okay, um, special prayers, um, and, and songs and piyutim leading up to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur on the first day. And the beginning of the month of Elul, the Ashkenazim start a little bit later, usually a week, week and a half before Rosh Hashanah. And most nights of Elul and of Tishrei during the high holidays, the Kotel will look like this, packed to the top. And the first piyut, the first song, the, the Sfaradim that will, they will say in Slichot, during the 40 days of Slichot, is called Ben, I, I'll translate it as we go along, I couldn't find a good translation. Ben Adam Malech Hanirdam Kum Look, during the year we go a lot of times sort of into cruise control. We do what we do. We don't always have time to stop and think. You know, um, think about what we're doing, think about where we're going, think about how we want to improve ourselves. Elul is the time to stop. Elul is the time um, to sort of uh, look into ourselves um, and think about things and think about, well, you know, I want to do this differently. I want to do that differently. It's a time to wake up. And that's the idea behind this song. It goes, Ben Adam Alechanirdam, Kum Krabetachanunim. Listen, person, don't fall asleep. Wake up. It's time to wake up and start praying. Shfoch Sicha, Drosh Sicha, Me'adon Ha'adonim. Pray, talk, demand forgiveness from the heavens. Rechatz Hutar, Ve'al Te'achar, Beterem Yamim Ponim. Prepare yourself, purify yourself before it's too late. Um, don't miss this opportunity to wake up and try to do something, to do, be different. And quickly run for help in front of the heavens. We're still in the area of the marketplace. Okay, again, just to reorient you, here's the wall, here's the pavement stones, 
Here's the columns. And before we leave this room, though, let's take a look at something interesting. When this area was found by the archaeologists, they found a very clean pavement stone over here. And not only did they find a very clean pavement stone over here, they also found this bedrock over here sticking out of the mountain and this etching into the actual bedrock itself. What's the story? Well, the work apparently was, not, was never totally finished. This clean pavement stone over here was meant to be put into, excuse me, into somewhere. We don't know where. It was never put into place. The bedrock over here was being used as a quarry, and they were going to actually take this piece out over here that's on the left side of my screen and use it for somewhere. The work was never done. So Herod started the work, but we know from different sources that the work continued for dozens of years, almost until even the destruction of the Second Temple. You know those places, be it a massive intersection or somewhere else, that the work just goes on and on and on your entire life? It's a little bit the feeling over here with the Temple Mount, and we can see that over here, an example of that with the pavement stone and the bedrock over here. But what we're going to do now is, is we're going to continue walking along uh, the Kotel tunnels, and we're going to start making our way to our final stop, but we still have what to see along the way. And we're going to be leaving the Kotel. There we go, Zell. It's behind us. Here it is. Okay. And we're leaving it right before we get to the northwest corner. And what we're going to do now is, is we are entering a, this area over here. And this is what's called the Hasminian Aqueduct. In my opinion, it, it, physically at least, it's the most beautiful area of the tunnel. And take a look. What happened was, was either during the time of the story of Hanukkah, the Maccabees, or now they're even staying in research a little bit before 21, 2200 years ago, if not even more, there was a natural crack in the earth, which from above was widened into this beautiful area that we can see today. And we can even see the pavement stones that are covering the top over here that were that covered this aqueduct 22 plus 2200 20, years ago plus minus whenever it was created and as we make our way through realize how slick the actual bedrock is on one side and on the other side over here from the water that used to flow through here water would flow through this aqueduct from the north all right we're talking several hundred feet from the north from the area of Damascus gate Shar Shem the water would flow through here and eventually make its way to the area of the Temple Mount. But this becomes problematic for King Herod. Why is that? Because King Herod is going to enlarge the mass of the area of the Second Temple by building this massive Temple Mount um, all around it. And in addition to that, we were just in the area of a marketplace on the western side of the Temple Mount. Those water will flood the marketplace. So what Herod does is he's going to build a type of a dam, all right? He's going to build a large pool, which is called <laughs> the Starotian Pool. And the water that we can see over here is just a small part of this large Starotian Pool that stopped the flow of the water. And that is why we walked through a dry aqueduct right now and why we could stand in the marketplace of Herod before when it was dry. Now, this is going to be our last stop. And I don't want to talk about this pool over here so much. I want to talk much more about this arch that's above our heads. Now, here's the thing. We can stand in different places, and as a tour guide, I can say, look, this arch that we're looking at is an original arch from 1,800 years ago. And some of you will say, okay, that's cool, that's interesting. And others will say, all right, nice, but doesn't really interest me. But there's a story behind this arch. And the story is a story um, of despair, but also of hope. Why despair and hope? Because the second temple was destroyed in the year 70 of the Common Era. After its destruction, though, the Jews do not give up. It'll take 60 years, but 60 years later, there's going to be a charismatic leader named Shimon Bar Kochva, who is backed by the spiritual leader Rabbi Akiva. And they're going to start another huge rebellion that's called the Bar Kochva Rebellion against the Romans. The years 132 to 135, the common era. You don't need to remember it, I'm just saying it to put this into context. Now, who are they going to fight against? Not just the Romans, but against the Roman ruler, a man whose name is Hadrian, Adrianus, Hadrian Caesar. And with this rebellion going on for three years, after these three years, Hadrian is going to end the rebellion in a horrible, horrible way. And the Jews, Bar Kochva and Rabbi Akiva, are going to be thoroughly defeated. Hadrian Caesar is going to say, I am sick and tired of the Jews rebelling against us Romans again and again and again. Let us take the wind out of their sails. First of all, I'm not going to allow them into Jerusalem anymore. The Jerusalem is what gave them the, the push and the motivation to rebel. Not allowed to enter Jerusalem. 
In addition to that, says Adrian Caesar, I'm going to take the name Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, and throw it out into the garbage can of history. I'm going to give the city a new name called Ilia Capitolina. And I'm going to build a Roman city. Basically, Jewish Jerusalem has been destroyed. It's going to build a Roman city. And as part of the Roman city, you build generic things in any Roman city around the world. He's going to build a forum above this arch that we can see in front of us right now. Forum is a place of gathering different things going on. You'll see everybody there, of course, besides the Jews. Now, if we go today to the archaeology wing of the Israel Museum, we will see a statue of Hadrian Caesar, of Adrianus Kesav. And every year, on Tisha B'Av, the date of the destructions of the temples and at the end of the Bar Kokhba rebellion, Israel Erdad, in the past, a central figure within Israeli society, who's a stern as of himself, he would come up, and in front of the statue of Hadrian Caesar, he would say in Hebrew, Adrianus, Adrianus, Efo Ata, Ve'efo Nachnu. Hadrian, Hadrian, where are you today, and where are we today? You and the Romans are all archaeology, quite impressive and beautiful archaeology, but archaeology, statue over here, and we the Jewish people are still growing and flourishing. Um, and that, in my opinion, I think is the important thing to take from our tour today as we made our way through Yerushalayim, the old city, the Kotel Amaravi, the Kotel Tunnels, and especially during the special time of Slichot, when we're flocking these places physically, and if we can't come to there physically for whatever reason, we're coming to there virtually. I think that is the important thing to remember today. So I want to say thank you very much. And as I always say, if you have, well, we have time for questions now, but um, if you never have an opportunity to ask a question or you think of a question afterwards, shoot me an email. It's right over here. And with that, we can go over to Tamar and open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Ami. And you know, Ami might have not um, said so himself, but uh, Ami was a tour guide for years, one of the most um, well-known and appreciated, I think, tour guides at the Kotel Tunnel. So hopefully when, you, when things change and people can come again, you're welcome to look him up. Let's see about a question. Um, regarding how they used to move the, the big rock, the huge rock, so uh, Bruce wanted to know, said it would be interesting if a real experiment was carried out of trying to move a rock like that. Do you know if anyone tried to do it? I don't know. It's a good question. And archaeologists have tried to uh, um, um, re reenact a lot of these things. I don't know if they tried to reenact moving a 600 ton stone. But I'll tell you something else. If Freddie brought it up, I'm not giving an exact answer to the question because I don't, I don't know the exact answer. But I did mention before that literally this morning a report in the news came out that they found a quarry in the area of Harachotzvim, which is a few miles north of there, the Temple Mount. And they, in addition to finding the quarry, they also found tools that help them separate the stones, quarry out the stones from the mountain. That's going to help a lot of the research understand how they separate, actually separated the stones from the actual quarry. So um, that's the best answer that I can give at the moment. OK, I want to say, uh, um, when, uh, someone mentioned that the Statue of Liberty weighs around 200 tons. So compare oh. that to the rock. <laughs> Thanks. All right, no, never knew that. OK. Uh, let's see, what other questions do we have? Um, lots of Shana Tova. Um, there was a question at the beginning. I, I, I don't know if you can answer it. If um, the same hero you're speaking about is the one um, associated with Jesus. Yes, yes, it's the same hero that's associated with Jesus, um, uh, where he said that he, Herod said he wants, so it's connected to the story of Moses and Pharaoh, or just like Pharaoh had heard that uh, from one of the firstborns there will be a, a Messiah that comes from Israel, so too here had heard that there will be, from the different sons that are born, there's going to be a new leader, Messiah, that's going to come, and he ordered um, it, all the different males um, uh, to be killed. Uh, this is the same Herod, even though at the end of the day it doesn't connect with all of the years, because Herod ended up passing away in the year four before the common era, and Jesus will be born a few years later. But yes, in the story of the New Testament, this is the same Herod. Yes, it is. Okay. Can you give a tip to our audience? Some might want to look up um, the YouTube um, videos you use. Sure, um, sure. I want to know how to find them. Megalim Institute. Go into YouTube, just write Megalim Institute, and a lot of different videos um, it will pop up. Some in English, some in Hebrew. I'm assuming if you're at Megalim Institute in English, hopefully most of them will be in English. And you'll see like many, a dozen or so videos. They're all excellent. 
Um, they're animated movies between seven to 15 minutes long. Great. So just before we say just a word about your tour next, uh, in two weeks, we'll be meeting here again um, with a tour for Sukkot. I'll let Ami say a few words. We do have two other events in English coming up next week. On Sunday, Professor Ruth Weiss and Dr. Asael Eberman will be talking about her, my quarrel with Hirsch Rissainer, story by Chaim Grade. So that's going to be on Sunday. And next Tuesday, Rabbi Shai Fickelstein will be giving a special talk in preparation for Yom Kippur. Um, Ami, do you want to say where we'll be traveling in two weeks? Sure, so in two weeks from now, we're going to be walking in the footsteps of the Ole Regel, of the pilgrims. We're going to be walking with them hand in hand to Yerushalayim. We'll be leaving from their homes and walking with them, seeing how they made their way to Jerusalem, what they did along the way, what happened when they arrived to Jerusalem and when they came up to Beit HaMikdash, to the temple. Okay, so thank you very much. Please feel free to join us for the pilgrimage. And Shana Tova, I have a healthy year, a happy year from all of us here at Beit Uh Thank you very much. Not all right.